Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Hong Kong Symposium, Science for the Future. My name is Vivian, your MC for today. The Hong Kong Symposium, Science for the Future, is jointly organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences and the Future Science Award Foundation to showcase the strength of Hong Kong in fundamental scientific research and to promote science and technology cooperation in Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. We have invited leaders in academe, science and technology, industry, commerce, investment, the government and other sectors to promote synergy between sectors and enjoy a look into how science will shape the future. The symposium has joined the InnoCanovo 2022 organized by the Innovation and Technology Commission as one of its events. May I now invite Professor Le Chi Choi, founding president of the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences and co-chair of the Science Committee of the Hong Kong Symposium to give an opening message. Professor Choi, please. It's very difficult to speak with the mask and glasses on because uh, <laughs> it fogs up very quickly. Anyway, uh, the Honorable Executive Vice President of the China Association of Science and Technology, Mr. Zhang uh, uh, Yuzhuo, the Honorable Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry, Professor Sun Dong, distinguished guests, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It really gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this Hong Kong Symposium entitled Science for the Future. I wish to thank Mr. Zhang and Professor Sun for making special efforts to join us today amidst a very busy schedule. On this uh, auspicious occasion, I must tell you that the idea behind this symposium originated from Dr. Harry Shum the 2022 Rotating Chairman of the Council for Future Forum, who called me up late last year. He talked to me about the possibility of collaboration between the Future Science Prize Foundation, or Council, and the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences to hold the annual Future Symposium in Hong Kong this year. I was obviously overjoyed by Harry's proposal because this symposium would offer a great opportunity for the symposium to showcase and promote Hong Kong's science and technology, which is fully in, the, in line with our nation's 14th five-year plan for Hong Kong to become an international innovation technology center and to strengthen collaboration and cooperation in science and technology within the Greater Bay Area. In fact, as we know, Hong Kong is very strong in basic research in many science and technology areas. Just for the future science prize alone, five out of the 27 laureates are based in Hong Kong. Accordingly, we decided that the symposium would be arranged under three themes, namely life sciences, physical science, and mathematics and computer science. We have invited a group of scientists to serve on the science committee of the symposium and to expand the ideas and arrange for speakers and panel discussions. The result, as you can see from today's program. Altogether, there are more than 20 scientists, investors, and industrialists to report on their latest breakthroughs, share their knowledge and views, and exchange insights on how science can shape the future of humanity under each of the three sessions, namely creating new paradigm in life science, the beauty, tangible and intangible impact of fundamental physical science, and Shenzhen Hong Kong Collaborative Innovation under the mathematics and computer science. However, due to the lingering COVID-19 pandemic around us, along with travel restrictions, and compulsory quarantine arrangements, we are unable to have all the speakers and participants 
gathered in a single venue in Hong Kong Science Park for the symposium here. Nevertheless, we're glad that a satellite venue has been arranged with the support by Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen for speakers and participants in the Greater Bay Area and that other speakers and participants are going to join the symposium online. Furthermore, the complete symposium is being live streamed through social media in both the mainland and Hong Kong for people interested in our discussion today. While the proceedings of the symposium is conducted in English and Putonghua, the live stream version broadcasted via social media in mainland we have Chinese subtitles, kindly provided by Tencent. So on behalf of the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences and the Science Committee of the Symposium, I wish to thank all the committee members, session conveners, keynote speakers online, and uh, of course on site, uh, panelists, and all the other participants for their hard work and contributions. I would also like to thank all our partners and supporting organizations, particularly the Innovation and Technology Commission for its funding support, and all our colleagues who have worked so hard on the symposium in the past 10 months. So last time, may I wish the symposium a great success and hope you all enjoy the program we have for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Cho. May I now invite Dr. Henry Shum, Rotating Chair, Council of the Future Forum for 2022, and co-chair the Science Committee of the Hong Kong Symposium to give an opening message. Dr. Shum will deliver his message using a pre-recorded video. Dr. Shum, please. 各位嘉宾,女士们,先生们,朋友们,大家好。我是未来论坛理事会2022年轮值主席沈江阳。首先我代表未来论坛这是两大科学界公益力量的首度合作我们非常荣幸地邀请到了多位未来科学大奖的获奖者和其他的著名科学家宣讲他们的最新科研突破探讨科学将如何塑造人类的未来未来论坛创立于二零一五年投资界一批有影响力有情怀的领袖人物共同发起是连接前沿科技承载人类科技梦想的跨界科学工业组织未来科学大奖成立于二零一六年是由科学家企业家群体共同发起的民间科学奖项旨在奖励在中国内地香港
共筑来自科学界的建设性的事，探索未知未来的发展方向，为香港建设成为全球科技创新高地提供助力。世界在加速变化，新科学、新发现、新技术，让我们对未来充满了期待。面对无限可能，开放式的探讨。引人兴奋、遐想，更源源不断的激发大家探知未来的未知的热情。科学能预见未来，科学更能构建未来。希望参与今天活动的嘉宾和观众们都有所收获。接下来，请我们用热烈的掌声，有请中国科学技术协会分管日常工作的副主席张玉卓院士。和香港特别行政区政府创新科技及公益局局长孙东教授致开幕词，谢谢大家。Thank you, Dr. Shum. May I now invite Mr. Yu Zhuang, Executive Vice President of the China Association for Science and Technology (CAST), member of the Chinese Academy of Engineering, former member of the U.S. Nation. No Academy of Engineering to give an opening remark. Mr. Zhang will defer his remark through a pre-recorded video. Mr. Zhang, please. 尊敬的沈向阳主席、徐立之院长、女士们、先生们、朋友们，大家好。很高兴参加香港论坛“科学见未来”论坛活动。我代表中国科学技术协会，向论坛的举办表示热烈的祝贺，向与会各位嘉宾表示诚挚的敬意。科学求真探源，正本清源，是人类挑战未知、探索未来的瑰丽事业。每一次重大的科学发现。都是从未知到已知，从不确定性到确定性的跨越，是人类认识自然能力的升华。科学家群体秉持科学精神，遵循科学规律，坚守科学规范，以科学持久繁荣，昭示着人类文明的美好未来。基础研究是科学之本，技术之源。繁荣基础研究为创新驱动发展、孕育源头提供储备，是政府和全社会的共同责任。习近平主席在科学家座谈会上指出，要加大基础研究投入。首先是国家财政要加大投入力度，同时要引导企业和金融机构以适当方式加大支持，鼓励社会以捐赠和建立基金等方式多渠道投入。2021年，我国基础研究投入达到 1,817 亿元，是2012年的 3.6 倍。持续保持上升势头，全社会支持基础研究的良好氛围正在形成。未来科学大奖由科学家、企业家群体共同发起设立，体现了投资未来的战略眼光，必将激励创新创造、厚植创新沃土。中国科学高度赞赏。并积极倡导社会各界共同支持基础科学，扶持人才成长，促进科学普及。期待通过未来论坛系列科学活动的举办和未来科学大奖的设立，着力打造科学家交流创新思想的原地，展示科技前沿的载体，传播科技新知的平台。激励科学家探索无止境的前沿，提升
青少年热爱科学、崇尚创新的兴趣，推动面向国际科技界的开放合作，共同丰富人类的科学宝库。本次论坛在香港举办，有着特殊意义。今年是香港回归祖国二十五周年。习近平主席视察香港，并发表重要讲话，指明香港未来的发展方向。历经风雨后，香港浴火重生，展现蓬勃生机。中国科协愿与香港特区政府一道，共同深化交流合作，支持香港科技工作者更好融入国家发展大局。在推进粤港澳大湾区发展和高水平科技自立自强中，敢为天下先，敢做弄潮儿，敢当排头兵，为推动“一国两制”实践新示范注入新动能。最后，祝愿本次论坛取得圆满成功，祝愿各位嘉宾、各位朋友身体健康。工作顺利，家庭幸福，万事如意。谢谢大家。Thank you, Mr. Zhang. May I now invite Professor Dong Sun, Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry, the Government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Fellow Canadian Academy of Engineering, Member the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Fellow, the International Academy of Medical and Biological Engineering, Fellow of IEEE, to give an opening remark. Professor Sun, please. Dear Professor Choi, Harry, Zhang Yanshi, Honorable Speakers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. I'm most honored to join you all today at the Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong uh, Symposium Science for the Future. First of all, I would like to thank the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences and the Future Science Awards Foundation for co-organizing this symposium and bringing many of the Future Science Prize lawyers and world's most renowned and influential scientists together to share their perspective on how the future of humanity would be shared by science and technology. The annual Future Science Prize pays tribute to the outstanding scientists in mainland China Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan for their remarkable scientific breakthroughs and innovations in the areas of life science, physical science, as well as mathematics and computer science. I'm so proud that four distinguished scientists from Hong Kong were awarded the prize since its inception. The award is not only a recognition of the remarkable achievements of our fellow Hong Kong scientists, but it is also an evidence of Hong Kong's excellent capabilities in scientific research. Over the past few years, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region government has invested an unprecedented amount of resources to promote the anti development of Hong Kong, thereby laying a solid foundation for the continuous enhancement of our INT ecosystem. President Xi's visit to the Hong Kong Science Park in this June demonstrated the importance and, uh, and acknowledgement our country placed on Hong Kong's INT development and the expectation of Hong Kong contribution to the country's development in science and technology. Looking ahead, leveraging our country's strong support and our extensive connection with the world, as well as the vast opportunities 
brought about by the National 14th Five-Year Plan and the Greater Bay Area Development. This term of government is firmly committed to develop Hong Kong into an international INT center and will push forward our INT development along the four major directions. To chart Hong Kong in full steam towards our vision, as announced by the chief executive in his policy address delivered on this Wednesday, we are promulgating the Hong Kong INT development blueprint, which is going to clearly set out our major strategies for the INT development in Hong Kong from the top level perspective. Firstly, we will further enhance the INT ecosystem of Hong Kong. It is essential to promote cross-disciplinary collaboration among the government, industry, academic, and the research sectors so that we can strengthen the coordination of the upstream, midstream, and downstream development. Particularly, we have to incentivize the universities to proactively push ahead the midstream technology transfer and to commercialize their, out their outstanding R&D outcomes. To this end, we will roll out a new funding scheme, namely the Research, Academic, an industry sector's one plus game, risk plus game in short, in the coming year to provide funding on a matching basis for research teams in universities which have good potential to become anti startups, so as to encourage most collaboration among industry, academic, and research sectors to drive the end, to drive a one to end transformation of outstanding R&D results and the tech industry development. Second, we will further enlarge our talent pool to create strong impetus for the growth. Talent is the most important element for INT development. We must nurture, retain, and attract talents so as to ensure the INT development of Hong Kong in a healthy and a sustainable manner. We will be working closely with the newly established office for attracting strategic enterprises to provide special complementary measures in a target manner to attract top-notch R&D talents to bring with them their business or R&D outcome to Hong Kong. We will also enhance our existing, talent, uh, existing tech talent schemes and accommodation support, thereby improving our competitiveness for outstanding talents. Third, we are devoted to develop Hong Kong into a smart city to enable our members of the public to enjoy the convenience and improvements to their daily lives brought by the, te brought by the technical, uh, technical advancement. Last but not least, we will actively integrate into the overall national development and consolidate Hong Kong's advantages as an international city. Indeed, integration into the national development is our first and the foremost mission. The Great Bay Area is the best platform for Hong Kong to leverage its strengths to contribute to the country's needs. We will move full steam ahead with the construction of the Hong Kong Shenzhen INT Park in the Loma Chow Loop and expedite the development of San Tian Technopole in the northern metropolis. We will also study the trail implementation of a cross-boundary policy on INT cooperation, covering the flows of materials, capital, data, and the people between Hong Kong and Shenzhen on the basis of one zone, two parks, and through in-depth cooperation with Shenzhen. Meanwhile, we will give full play to Hong Kong's advantages as an international city and attract INT enterprises around the globe to the Hong Kong Shenzhen INT Park in the loop, so as to create key impetus to the development of an international INT center in the Greater Bay Area. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the recruitment of payload specialists from Hong Kong demonstrates the country's confidence in Hong Kong's level in scientific research and the country's care for the development of Hong Kong's young people. The recruitment period will close on Thursday, October 27, and I appeal to those aspired for aerospace, aerospace uh, study to grasp this unprecedented chance. Albert Einstein once said, the whole of science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. I'm sure that today's discussion is going to be inspiring and bring us more bright idea and innovation. I wish today's symposium a great success and a fruitful experience for all of you. Thank you very much. Professor Sun, thank you, Professor Sun. Please remain on stage. Thank you. Let's join the group photo taking. We will take two group photos. For the first one, may I invite the foreign honorable guests? Please, Professor Lep Chi Choi, Mr. David Yu, Ms. Lillian Cheng, Ms. Nisa Learn, Professor Chi Meng Chi, Mr. James Chi Xu Li, Professor Nancy Yi, Professor Dennis Low, Professor Kwok Yong Yun, Professor Vivian W.W. Yam, Professor Ngai Meng Mok, Professor Ken Piu Lok, Professor Fok Yi Kuo, Professor Chi Teng Chen, and Mr. Philip Chai. Now, please smile for the camera in the center first. And then for the camera on the left, to the audience. And one on the right. Thank you, thank you all of you. Would the foreign honorable guests please remain on stage for the second photo? Professor Lab Chi Choi, Professor Dong Sun, Ms. Lillian Cheng, Mr. David Yu, Ms. Lisa Learn, Mr. James Chi Xu Li, Mr. Philip Chai, please remain on stage and the rest honorable guests please be seated. Thank you. May I now invite the foreign honorable guests on stage? Mr. Junius Kwan Yu Ho, Mr. Chun Sing Lam, Mr. Duncan Chiu, Mr. Dennis Chi Wing Learn, Professor Paul Kwan Sing Lam, Professor Lena Kwok Hong Cheng, Mr. Sunny Chai, Professor Timothy W. Tong, Professor Anderson Shum. Please come on the stage and take the photo. Please smile for the camera at the center first. And then we look at the left for the audience. And then look at the right. Thank you. Thank you all of you. Please be seated. Thank you. Now, let's take a group photo of all of us. Now, our photographer will be taking this photo from the stage. And please get ready. Now, please look at the photographer on the stage. One more photo for the photographer. And now, please give a like to the
Symposium, yeah. We'll give a like to the photographer and take one more photo. Okay, thank you. After the photo, we will now start the th three science section. Each section will start with several keynote speeches, followed by our panel discussion and a Q&A time. In the Q&A time, because limited time is available, we can only have one question for the Hong Kong venue, one question from the Shenzhen venue, and one question from the Zoom audience. Our helpers will provide a microphone for the on-site audience to ask the questions. For Zoom participants, please raise your questions by using the checkbox of Zoom well in advance, and we will select one question to answer. We can now start the first session, the life science section, creating new paradise. May I now invite Professor Lo Yok Meng Dennis, the convener of the section, to come on stage. Professor Lo is the director of Li Ka Sheng Institute of Health Sciences, the Li Ka Sheng Professor of Medicine and the Professor of Chemical Pathology in the Chinese University Hong Kong CUHK, founding member of the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences and the Future Science Prize 2016 Life Science Prize Laureate. Professor Lo will give an introduction to the section and a keynote speech under the title of Circulating DNA molecules in plasma coming all sizes and shapes. Professor Lo, please. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Professor Sun Dong, Academician Jiang, Professor Lap Chi Cho, Mr. David Yu, and Ms. Lillian Zhang, and distinguished guests and fellow scientists. So, welcome to the first section of the life science which is about creating new paradigms. Now, in scientific research and probably in many other endeavors in life, if we just follow the path taken by other people, then usually the advances that we will make are just incremental in nature. To really make something important, and which is of lasting value, we really need to break the mold and to create something new. And that's how difficult problems are solved. So in our talk today, we have uh, four speakers. They are all internationally renowned scientists who have uh, won many awards, including two speakers who have won uh, Future Science Prizes before. And they will explore with us a big spectrum of questions. So ranging from the fetus from prenatal to the other end of life, diseases which affect the elderly people, such as Alzheimer's disease, and they also explore diseases which are chronic and those which are acute, such as infections. For example, the whole world has been gripped with COVID for the last uh, almost three years. And then we even have one speaker who will talk about a new type of biology which is completely different, which is, doesn't exist on this world, which is completely artificially created, called mirror image biology. And then after that, we'll ask them how their work and others is going to shape science for the next two decades. Now, so without further ado, so maybe I'll start with my talk. So today, I'd like to talk about some of our work on molecular diagnostics. And particularly, I work on DNA which are circulating in our blood. So I'm just trying to... Now, the reason why this field is unusual, which break existing paradigm, is we all know that DNA is normally found inside cells. But interestingly, for the last 25 years, I've been actually looking at DNA which circulate outside cells. And so initially, actually, people thought that this field might not go anywhere. But anyway, I started on working in this field because in the field of prenatal diagnosis. So basically, when a woman is pregnant, she would like to know whether a baby is genetically normal or not. And one way to do that is to stick a needle into your uterus and take some fluids. But every time we do that, there is a chance that we might actually harm the baby or even kill the baby. So as a young doctor, I was thinking, well, is it possible that I can avoid that risk just by taking a blood sample from a mother? And of course, this breaks the current paradigm because we all know that our blood circulation system and our mother's blood circulation system are separate. So how can you do that? 
But I was thinking that maybe the existing thinking is wrong. Maybe it's possible the baby would release a little bit of his DNA into the bloodstream of mother. So do a situation where if a baby is a boy, they can see the Y chromosome in the mother's blood. And then the number one reason why pregnant women go for prenatal testing is because they're worried the baby might have Down syndrome, which is basically a normal individual have 46 chromosomes, and a Down syndrome individual have one more in chromosome 21. But existingly, if you try to uh, detect Down syndrome, then you have to take a cells from the individual you suspect to have Down syndrome. And then you count how many chromosomes that cell has. But as I told you just now, in my field, there's no cells. The DNA is just swimming outside cells. So how can you use something which is flowing outside to reconstruct what is inside? So actually, interesting, it took us 10 years to actually think about doing that. So what I was thinking about is that if there are millions of those molecules floating in the blood, and some of those are from the baby, the one in red, the black one is from mother, and because I know the human genome sequence, maybe I can just randomly sequence those molecules and then map to each chromosome, and then try to find the ratios of different chromosomes. Because you imagine if the ratio is one to one, that's normal. But it's a little bit deviate from one to one, that's abnormal. It's almost like I want to know how, much, how many coins you have in your wallet. I can ask you to take your wallet out to count it, but that's invasive. But in another way, if I can create a balance, which is very accurate, ask you to stand on balance, the day when you have two coins versus the day you have one coin, your weight will change a little bit. So I'm building that balance this way. And surprisingly, when I did that, I find that the test is amazingly accurate. It is 99.7% accurate. And it's so accurate that within 10 months after we did this, the test was actually launched internationally, and now it's actually done by over 90 countries or regions. And the technology is called non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT for short. Now, so normally, if we are sticking to paradigm, after I did this, I would just relax, right? I just, maybe if you have a pattern, we'll just collect royalties for the next 20 years. But interestingly, I've decided to challenge myself. So I actually asked one of our students, actually she's in the audience today, so Stephanie Yu. I said, well, okay, we have got this test, which is counting molecules. Can you create me another test which is different in technology, in which our existing pattern doesn't cover it. And so Stephanie go and think. And then we think, okay, if you count molecules, apart from counting it, you can characterize the molecule to say the molecule, how long is a molecule. So, so normally our genome has three billion base pair. So very long, it's like two meters long. But when I ask Stephanie to go and measure this, we should find that the DNA in the circulation is very short. You can see it's something like 50 to 200 of those units, very short. And then you can see that the blue line is from a baby and the red line is from a mother. So the baby's DNA is a little bit shorter than mother's DNA. So you have this situation, the baby is short, the mother is long. That means that in a blood sample, the more baby's DNA you've got, the shorter it's going to be. Now, for example, like in this graph here, you can see the size there, and I have two tubes of blood, one in which the baby's DNA concentration is 20%, and the other one is 10%. So we look at the short molecule, then the one with 20% will have high peaks like this. But on the other hand, if we're looking at longer molecules, then of course it's reverse. But you know, of course, obstetrician doctors are very busy. If you ask them to look at this graph every time, they just won't use your test. So we need to simplify it for them. So I need to simplify to a number that any doctors can use. So I decided to actually use something called size ratios, which is very simple. Just say short molecules over long molecule. And surprisingly, when I plot the size ratio, which is on the y-axis, I find that it's proportional to how much fetal DNA I have in the sample. And this is important because this concentration is the number one determinant of how accuracy the non-invasive prenatal test is. And previously, before this technology, to measure that is very complicated. You have to say, if the baby is a boy, I can measure Y chromosome DNA. But if a baby is a girl, you can't do it. 
But now, suddenly, you can do this with this size. And then I wonder, can we push it further? So I was thinking, OK, the mother is long. The baby's be a short. Now, if the baby has Down syndrome, it will have an extra copy of chromosome 21, which is also releasing a short DNA in the blood. So if that's the case, it should pull down the distribution of size from that chromosome. So we go and test this. You can see this is in chromosome 21. If the baby has Down syndrome, then actually, indeed, the size ratio of this chromosome 21 is abnormal compared with the other uh, normal pregnancies. If the baby has abnormality in chromosome 18, then chromosome 18 has different size. If the baby has abnormality in chromosome 13, then the baby will have the different size distribution there. Just as with this one done, we have managed to create a new method which overcome our previous one, which is a general method to measure how fetal DNA is, and is an alternative to detect this test. So what I'm trying to show you is basically, even we have one solution, we still will need to push on and do another. So now, this thing is quite interesting. Right? You have long DNA, and it seems to have some molecular scissors which are cut into shorter fragments. And actually, we've been working on this for the last 10 years or so. And this field is now called fragmentomics, the study of fragmentation. And size is just one of those. It's like you go to a barber to cut your hair. Depending on what type of scissors the barber will use, your hair will look differently. Just like in this case, different organs or different diseases in our body will have different molecular scissors. And they allow us to see the size or whether the ends is very sharp or whether it's jacket and what the ends look like. So now, this is the emerging field of fragmentomics. But let's look at the other side. So how intact can a molecule with be? So in other words, in the blood, there's a molecule which are fragmented, like I told you just now. But are there some molecules which are not fragmented? So what I'm thinking is this. I've shown you this graph just now, where we measure the size of the DNA molecule. I told you that they are very short. But I start to question, is this the complete picture? Or is this picture by someone? Just like when you're wearing a glasses with a different color, when you look into a world, the world looks a different color. So when I measure the size I showed you just now, I'm using a sequencer from a company called Illumina. And Illumina sequencer will only measure short molecules. So I'm thinking, well, that is a little bit biased. So what happened if I use a newer generation DNA sequencer, the so-called single molecule sequencer, third generation sequencing, such as made by this company called Pacific Biosciences? Can I see something else I can't see before? So we did this experiment recently, and you can see if I use Illumina sequencer, only short molecules are seen. But suddenly, when I do the, the, the new generation sequencer, I start to see the long molecules, which was invisible before. And those molecules are quite a lot, actually. If you look at the first trimester of pregnancy, a median of 15% of the molecules are long. You would go up to 20% in second trimester and go up to 30% in the third trimester, which is amazing. So the last 25 years, we're missing all those molecules. Now, if it's very long, then theoretically, it will contain more information. Now, for example, in our genome, every 1,000 bases we will have one potential difference. Now, similarly, in this case, a mother and baby will be different. But now, before this technology come along, I can only see maybe 150 or 200. But now, suddenly, with this new discovery, I'm seeing molecule which is like 16,000 or even 24,000 in length. And just with one molecule, I can see multiple of those differences. And this Biologically, it's called haplotype. It's almost like a molecular barcode. So the longer the barcode, the more discriminatory you have. But in addition, I can also use it to look at where that molecules come from in our body. Now imagine, look at me. I have billions of cells in my body, but all of those cells have the same DNA sequence. So the genetic sequence is the same. But my brain cell functions differently from my heart cell. And the reason is because the same genetic backbone is modified differently. Almost like this room, I can decorate with different furniture, 
different paintings, etc. That is called epigenetics. So a few years ago, we used epigenetics to develop a way in which you can tell the DNA molecules in your blood where it is coming from. I call this plasma DNA tissue mapping. But a problem about this approach is that to change from genetics to epigenetics, it typically requires the use of a, a very nasty chemical called bisulfite. If you treat with this chemical, 90% of the DNA might be killed. So it's very bad news. And also because the chemical is so nasty, I'm worried that even if you have long molecules, it will be broken down artificially. So basically we're thinking, is it possible we can deduce a new method to deduce epigenetics without using nasty chemical? So we're thinking that whether during the DNA sequencing, there might be some hidden information of epigenetics which is in there. So imagine when you're doing DNA sequencing, there's an enzyme called polymerase will copy the DNA and they'll give you some signals, different colors, different durations, and different gaps between signals. It's almost like you're driving a car and you see an obstacle. Before you see an obstacle, you slow down your car and then you turn your car around the obstacle and then you go on. So without, seeing, without me seeing the obstacle, by looking at the trajectory of your car, I can deduce there is an obstacle there and how big it is. So in other words, by looking at the speed in which the DNA polymerase is copying DNA, maybe we can predict there's some epigenetic signal there. So we call this the holistic kinetic model, the HK model, of course, based on our lovely city. So this is work from a bioinformatician, Pei Yongjiang, who's also in the audience today. So basically imagine I can want to measure the epigenetic signal here, and then I measure all this holistic number and put it in the table here. Now because DNA is double-stranded, I can measure one strand, and then measure on the other strand, and then put them together in a table. Now the table looked to me almost like a picture. So Pei Yong and I was brainstorming, and we wonder, well, is it possible that we can use some of the AI technology that is used to look at pictures? So for example, if we look at the convolutional neural network, CNN, and let's see whether there's some hidden information there. And surprisingly, there is. As you can see on the y-axis, is to use the HK model, and the x-axis is to use a nasty chemical. You can see that basically we have extremely good correlation, 0.99, I can predict that. And I can do that in different tissues, blood cells, placenta, even some cancer cell line. The inner circle here is the HK model. The outer is the bisulfite, is the nasty chemical. You can see the color will tell you what is the epigenetic status. The correlation is very high, and each of those, I can basically predict that. So we just published this uh, uh, last year. And also, by using this technology, I can basically predict with a lot of accuracy where molecules come from. So this type of graph, basically, if you go to the top left-hand corner, is a perfect test. If it's down here in diagonal, it's a useless test. You can see, actually, this test is not bad. It's about point, over 0.9. And amazingly, you got the information free. Just use the sequencer and, and the HK model, and you got the information. And then we found out, well, can I use this technology to do some genetic testing, uh, testing of the baby? Now, previously, we invented this method back in 2010, which is a gold standard. We call relative haplotype dosage analysis. And this is a technology which is basically to measure the, of the two chromosomes from my mother which one go into the baby. It works, it's very accurate, but the problem is very expensive. But now, by the use of this HK model, we're even better. For example, you can use the previous technology, it's the blue one. You require you to sequence a lot of molecules before you saturate. But now, with this new technology, we can get saturation very quickly. So we just published this work around Christmas last year. Now, another thing to break paradigm is this. You think about this the baby living inside mother, is actually quite similar to a cancer growing in a patient. So we also wonder what we have discovered here. Can it also be used for cancer detection? And interestingly, we can. So for example, here you can see that 
in cancer patients, once again, you use the Illumina, the short sequencing, you can only see short molecules. But suddenly, by using this new generation sequencing, I start to see the long molecules. And furthermore, you can see even the long molecules contain a mutation from cancer. And also, once again, similar to the prenatal situation, this test is pretty good. And once again, that metric is over 0.9. So the analogy of discovering these sort of long molecules is like this. So basically, for the last 25 years, we've been looking at short messages sent from a baby to us. And every time, we can only decode maybe 20 words. But now, we've been discovered long molecules for the first time. The baby can send up a whole word document to read. So I think it's very interesting. So we'll talk about this long cell-free DNA diagnostics and direct methylation analysis. I believe this technology allows us to see details which are invisible before. And so there are many unrealized diagnostic and research potential. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you that plasma DNA represents a treasure trove for molecular diagnostics. We talk about this new field of fragmentomics, talk about size and other things, and also talk about long cell-free DNA diagnostics and about this HK model. So finally, I'd like to thank individuals for my group for generating data which I present to you today. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo. Please be seated. Now, please welcome Professor Nancy Yok Yu Yip, President, the Morningside Professor of Life Science, Director of the State Key Laboratory, Molecular Neuroscience, the Hong Kong University of Science and Ontology and founding member of the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences to come on stage to deliver her keynote speech. The title of the speech is Circulating Proteins, Potential Game Changes in the Diagnosis and the Treatment of Alzheimer's Disease. Professor Yi, please. Thank you. I want to uh, first thank uh, Lapchi, uh, Harry, and organizers for inviting me to this uh, exciting symposium. Uh, I greatly appreciate this opportunity to share with you uh, the recent findings from my lab uh, on circulating proteins, which we believe are the game changers in the diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. With the aging population worldwide, including Hong Kong, there's an increase in prevalence of age-related degenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. Now, the most common form of Alzheimer's disease is the late onset uh, AD. And it has been uh, projected that by the year 2050, there will be more than 150 million people worldwide who are afflicted with this disease. It's also estimated that half of the individuals aged uh, over 85 will suffer from the disease. As you know, AD is an incurable and progressive neurodegenerative disease. I suppose we can view this as an invisible pandemic. The patients suffer from memory loss, faulty reasoning and judgment, as well as impairment in locomotor ability. The hallmark of this disease is the presence of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. Individuals that have mild impairment in cognitive function they are at high risk to progress to Alzheimer's disease. For the uh, 80 patients, when they have memory problem, they will consult the clinician. But by that time, they are already at a rather moderate or advanced stage of the disease. In fact, there are pathological changes that occur in the in the brain 10 to 20 years before the clinical symptoms uh, happen. 
currently, there's a lack of objective diagnostic tools. There's also a lack of effective interventions and treatment. So there is an urgent need for us to develop early diagnostic tool and also more effective interventions. The earlier is the diagnosis, the earlier can one have early interventions and hence more effective disease management. Now, we all believe that development of biomarkers is critical for AD diagnosis. With the advent of transformative technologies, we now have new AD biomarkers, including genetic, including gene transcript and protein expression, as well as brain imaging. Now, I believe that the identification of biomarkers can greatly enhance the diagnostic accuracy and also stratification of patients. And this would lead to more effective uh, diagnosis and also monitoring the response to disease-modifying treatment. I also believe that research based on biomarkers can help us identify novel disease targets for the disease and hence develop new strategies for identifying therapeutic treatment. Now I want to review with you the current AD diagnosis. They include clinical assessment by clinicians to take family history uh, for the individuals to do a written assessment. But this, I'm afraid, is too subjective. They are not objective enough. Another way of diagnosis is through brain imaging. For example, the amyloid PET imaging. But these are very expensive. And more recently, there's also development of biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid. But this is considered rather invasive. Hence, we believe that it is important and also urgent for us to develop blood-based biomarkers. For a while, it's believed that the pathological hallmarks can be detected in the blood, but these are very few protein biomarkers. But if we can develop a blood-based biomarker that is convenient, simple, and less invasive, they will have great potential for development. In order to achieve this, we have to first identify the blood biomarkers for AD. So my lab undertook a comprehensive study to identify the biomarkers that are associated with the disease and the progression. And how did we achieve this? We used the most advanced blood protein detection technology that gave us the sensitivity that we need because many of these proteins, they actually express at very low level in the blood. We also leveraged the high throughput big data analysis. So with these two technologies, we were able to overcome the challenge. We were able to overcome the bottleneck of the current blood testing technology and hence achieve the testing using small sample volume, a test that has high sensitivity and high throughput. So we first conducted a comprehensive screening of blood proteins in order to select for blood biomarkers with the characteristic of AD pathogenesis. This idea was very novel at that time because it was widely believed that one would not be able to identify so many proteins in the blood that are characteristic of the disease. 
So we first measured the levels of over 1,100 proteins in the blood. And we compare the, um, the level in AD patients versus the healthy control. Then we analyze which of these proteins are being altered in the AD patient. And using the big data analysis, we were able to come up with 19 proteins that we believe are the blood protein signature for the disease. Furthermore, we developed a scoring system that will allow us to do early screening and also staging of the disease with an accuracy of over 96%. So out of the 1,100 proteins that we assayed, we observed that more than 400 of these proteins were changed. Actually, a large number of these proteins were downregulated. And with this data, we further perform co-regulation analysis. We try to understand which of these proteins are co-regulated together. And through that kind of analysis, we identify 19 of such protein clusters. Within each protein cluster, we identify a hub protein. So the hub protein is representative of that particular cluster. So altogether, we came up with 19 hub proteins. We then use these proteins, the 19 protein biomarker panel, and compare with the so-called ATN panel. So I mentioned earlier that the pathological hallmarks of the disease include amyloid and tau. So the ATN panel was developed not too long ago, and it was used as the blood biomarker uh, test. But our blood biomarker panel with 19 proteins, when compared with the ATN panel, ours actually gave us better result. Then we use our 19 protein biomarker panel to analyze the AD patients. We found that we were able to um, diagnose the disease, and also we were able to stage the disease into mild and severe, and compared to the healthy control. We obtained very good association with the cognitive performance. So the score that we obtained, or the staging of the disease we, we were able to observe, actually correlate very well with the cognitive performance as reflected by the MOCA score. It also correlates very well with the hippocampal volume. So we believe that this panel can be applied to staging and monitoring the disease progression. Now, this particular diagnostic tool that we have developed is highly sensitive and specific. It can provide us with the tool to perform early diagnosis, which would give us better prognostics. It would also enable the continuous monitoring of the disease status. And finally, we can use this to screen suitable individuals for the clinical trials and also be able to monitor the efficacy of the therapeutic treatment. So we are currently developing a more cost-effective uh, blood test so that we can do large-scale screening. Now, just now, I focus more on the development of blood tests based on the biomarkers. I now want to shift to the second part of my talk, which is whether these plasma proteins actually can be developed as therapeutic targets for AD. 
Now, as you know, AD is a very complex disease. With the accumulation of A beta, it can trigger the immune cells in our brain called microglia. Microglia can phagocytose A beta, hence resulting in its clearance. But as A beta continues to accumulate during the progression of the disease, microglia became overwhelmed, hence resulting in the dysregulation of the cell type and chronic neuroinflammation, ultimately leading to deficits in synaptic remodeling and neurodegeneration. So pathogenesis of AD actually involves many cell types, and I highlighted a few of them here. It includes neurons, microglia, astrocytes, endothelial cells, all these different cell types in our brain. It is important for us to identify the molecular and cellular mechanisms that can contribute to the disease pathogenesis. The one pathway that we were particularly interested in is the one mediated by the cytokine IL-33. IL-33 acts as an alarm to maintain the immune homeostasis of our body. This cytokine mediates the cellular response by acting on this heterodimeric receptor complex, ST2, and IL-1 receptor accessory protein. ST2 receptor also occurs in a soluble form, and it serves as a decoy receptor. And by binding to IL-33, it can actually result in the inhibition of the normal function mediated by IL-33, and in doing so, it can be considered as an endogenous inhibitor. When we look at the level of soluble ST2 in the plasma of AD patients versus healthy control, we were very intrigued to observe that in the AD patients, there's a higher level of soluble ST2 in their plasma. Furthermore, we also observed that in the cerebral spinal fluid of the AD patients, the soluble ST2 level is also elevated. Now, when we look at the A beta plaque low, remember, A beta plaque is the pathological hallmark for the disease. We found that the higher the level of soluble ST2, the higher is the A beta plaque low. So what, what that says is that high level of soluble ST2 perhaps play a role in the deposition of A beta. So we did a lot of experiments using animal models, and I just want to show you two pieces of data to share with you what would be the consequence if you increase the level of soluble ST2 in the mice. And we did that by injecting soluble ST2 into the brain of those mice, injecting them using the ICV approach, that is, into the cerebral ventricles. When we compare the mice that got soluble ST2 injection versus the mice without, we found that the mice that got soluble ST2 injection, they actually have a much higher A beta plaque load. So what that means is that if you increase soluble ST2, you will actually exacerbate the uh, pathological changes in the brain of those mice. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that microglia is the cell type that phagocytose A beta and clear A beta. So we therefore use a fluorescent dye called methoxy XL4 to label the A beta, followed by flow cytometry analysis. And we look at the um, microglial A beta phagocytic ability. That is, 
When the mice have more solar velocity too, what would happen to the ability to phagocytose or eat up the A-beta? We found that the mice that receive solar velocity two injection, they have an impaired ability to phagocytose A-beta. So this observation is consistent with what we observed on the A-beta plaque low. That is, the higher the level of solar VST2, the worse is the ability of the microglia to eat up A-beta, and hence, the higher is the A-beta plaque load. So elevated level of solar VST2 plays a very important role in AD pathogenesis. So it, is this circulating protein soluble ST2 a good target for AD? So we conducted a number of experiments to try and understand how is this circulating protein regulated and whether it can contribute to the pathogenesis of the disease. And for this, we use advanced next generation sequencing technologies. So first, we perform whole genome sequencing of AD and healthy control in, uh, in Hong Kong. And then we perform the genome-wide association uh, analysis. For those individuals that have known data on the solo ST2 level, through the GVAS analysis, we were able to identify genetic variants at a particular locus, as shown here, IL-1 receptor L1 locus. This particular locus is what modulates the level of soluble ST2. We further identify a genetic variant highlighted here. This particular genetic variant, if the individual carries two copies of them, AA, they actually show a reduced, uh, a reduction in the level of soluble ST2 in the plasma. So what that means is individuals that carry this genetic variant, they will have lower level of soluble ST2. Now what is the brain cell type that make this soluble ST2? We perform the single nucleus RNA sequencing of human brain samples. And using this particular marker, CLDN5, which marks the endothelial cells, we were able to identify the human brain endothelial cells as the major, so major source of soluble ST2. Furthermore, we look at the level of soluble ST2 for the individuals that carry this variant and we were able to show that, indeed, in those individuals, the level of soluble ST2 is reduced. So the AA carrier has lower level of soluble ST2. So this is a very important finding because it shows that the genetic variant that we have identified is associated with decreased soluble ST2 gene expression in the endothelial cells. Now what would happen if we delete that particular region, that particular genomic region that harbor the genetic variant? For that, we turn to CRISPR technology to help us delete the specific regions that harbor the genetic variant. And we found that when we delete that particular genomic region, there is the uh, gene expression of soluble S22 is abolished. So it shows that the genetic variant that we have identified is a key genetic factor that regulates the soluble ST2 level. And I don't want to go into details of this analysis, but suffice to, to share with you that this particular uh, allele exerts a protective effect against AD risk. So how does it play a role in AD pathogenesis? We found that individuals that carry this protective variant, they have a delay in the onset of the disease. So comparing AA with the non-carrier, 
it also shows an increase in the uh, size of the entorhinal cortex. These are 80 uh, patients. Moreover, it can also protect against the brain atrophy, the brain shrinkage that is characteristic of 80 individuals. And this study was performed uh, in collaboration with the Australian group that has followed these individuals for 7.5 years. So the carriers, the protective carriers, actually has a slower uh, decline in terms of the brain uh, volume. Now, it is very important for us to figure out the mechanism. So again, by doing these single nucleus RNA sequencing analysis, we found that the individuals that carry this protective variant, they actually exhibit activation of the genes in the microglia. Remember, I mentioned earlier that microglia is the cell type that can uh, phagocytose A-beta, resulting in A-beta clearance. So the fact that the individuals that carry this protective variant show activation uh, of these genes that can mediate A-beta phagocytosis therefore reviews the underlying mechanism why these uh, individuals show the protective effect against AD. And finally, we perform additional studies to show that for individuals that carry this uh, allele, there is increased interaction between the plaque and the microglia. So this purple is microglia, the brown color is the plaque. So there's an increase in the interaction of microglia, microglia and the plaque, as shown here. And this is what led to the reduction of the A-beta plaque load in those individuals that carry the genetic uh, variant. So uh, just a summary slide to share with you. The cytokine that we look at, R33, acts on the microglia to trigger A-beta phagocytosis and hence the clearance of amyloid. During the disease progression, there is increase in the release of soluble ST2, which acts as a decoy receptor to inhibit the uh, beneficial action of IL-33 and hence resulting in increased deposition of A-beta. We have identified um, a protective uh, genetic variant that is associated with reduction of soluble ST2, and it can protect against AD risk. So this suggests that it is a good target for us to um, develop strategies for AD uh, intervention. It is also very important for us to use this to stratify patients for therapeutic treatment. And my lab is actively looking at development of modulators for soluble ST2. So I want to close the talk by thanking uh, the talented students and staff in my lab, and also uh, my collaborators that provide us with the clinical cohort, and my funding agencies uh, as well in Hong Kong and in the mainland. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yi. Please be seated. May I now invite Professor Yun Kwok Yong, the Henry Falk Professor in Infectious Diseases, the Chair of Infectious Diseases and the Co-Director, State Key Laboratory of Emerging Infectious Diseases of the University of Hong Kong, the Chief of Service, Department of Microbiology of the Queen Mary Hospital, and a founding member of the Hong Kong Academy of Sciences, the Future Science Prize 2021 Life Science Prize Laureate to come on stage to deliver his keynote speech. The title is Tackling Emerging Infections from SARS-03 to COVID-19. Professor Yun, please. So thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks to Lepshi and Harry for inviting me to give this talk on tackling emerging infections from SARS to COVID. 
So the, we, our team started on the coronavirus research in 2003 after we first saw the first few cases of SARS in Hong Kong. And together with Professor Marek Pires, we have uh, isolated uh, the SARS-CoV-1 from the lung tissue biopsy of these patients and then uh, proved the disease association. Then uh, Yi and also Bo Jian uh, go back to Shenzhen and track down the likely source of the SARS-CoV-1 in the seabeds, which are caged inside the Shenzhen wildlife market. But then subsequent research uh, in the wild seabeds and also the farm seabeds did not show any serological or molecular evidence of SARS-CoV-1. Only those seabeds inside the cages of the markets are positive. So we postulate that there is an unidentified animal natural reservoir for SARS-CoV-1. Now, two years later, we found that actually there is a bat SARS-related coronavirus in the Chinese horse bat, the Rhinolova senecus, which is subsequently confirmed by another group uh, led by Professor Lin Fa Wang. And uh, it's interesting to see that up to 39% of this interesting small flying mammal, uh, actually their anal swaps are positive. So 39% is actually very high for carrying this uh, SARS-related coronavirus in bats. And then in 2007, we make this prediction. The presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-like viruses in horse bats together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China is a time bomb. The possibility of the reemergence of SARS or other novel viruses from animals, and therefore the need for preparedness, should not be ignored. So that is in 2007. And that conclusion formed the basis of our virus surveillance program. So throughout the last 15 years, we have found more than 60 novel viruses in animals, with more than 30 of them being novel coronaviruses. But we did not realize the full public health significance of these new viruses until many years later. And especially in terms of the implication of the bad coronavirus HGU4 and 5, the bad SARS-related coronavirus, and also the porcine coronavirus HKU15. So in the year 2012, in the Middle East, there is a new uh, disease coming, and uh, they call it the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and that is caused by subsequently called MERS-CoV. Uh, and the, in the summary, the author said that the closest known relative are the bad coronavirus HQU4 and 5 which we found, first found in the year 2006. And then in early 2020, we identified the first family cluster of SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia at the Hong Kong U Shenzhen Hospital. And as you can see on the phylogenetic tree, this SARS-CoV-2 is actually closely clustering with the bad SARS-related coronaviruses that we and others found previously. And then in 2021, in this Nature paper, three children in Haiti are independently infe infected by a porcine delta coronavirus. And you can see that on the phylogenetic tree actually is quite related to the porcine coronavirus XQU15 that we found in the year 2012. Now all these outbreaks uh, teaches us something that the emerging infections, 75% are coming from animals. Sorry that uh, this map is deleted because it was said to be not acceptable online, so we have to delete it. And I just want to illustrate to you that in the Pearl River Delta, in the year 1999, Hong Kong is affected by the influenza A, H5N1, or we call the avian flu. And then in 2003, the Hong Kong especially, are initially affected by SARS-CoV-1, which then spread all over mainland and then also overseas. And in 2013, the avian influenza H7N9 started at Shanghai area around the Yangtze River Delta, which subsequently all spread all over the place, basically. 
And then, of course, uh, we now know that the SARS-CoV-2, which might have originated in other parts of the world, was introduced into Wuhan, which is a rapidly flourishing central traffic hub of the mainland. Now, that uh, tells us uh, the importance of a standing animal and human surveillance program for novel viruses. But remember that many of these surveillance programs only identify the virus genome. It is very difficult to culture the virus, especially from the animals. And that's why we are now developing bat intestinal organoids, or enteroids, which may maximize our chance of growing these animal viruses, especially in bats, but we can make other animal organoids to do the same. And the prediction of the potential to jump species barrier is even more difficult. So we also make human intestinal organoids and airway organoids especially, and see whether the animal viruses that we culture from, say, for example, bad androids, can infect the human airway organoids and assess the potential of interspecies jumping from animal to human. Now, the, we must thank the Professor Hans Clevers, who teach us the organoid technology. So what we did is uh, to get the normal lung tissue around uh, lung cancer patients, uh, the cancer of our lung cancer patients who donate the normal lung tissue to us. And then the Jane uh, harvested the adult stem cells from this lung tissue, put them in what we call the airway organoid medium and expand it and then put them in the proximal differentiation medium, which makes this cystic organoid much more compact. And by, say, 16, you can see that the amount of ciliated cells has markedly increased when compared with those in the airway uh, organoid medium, and also much less amount of club cells. But no matter what, uh, all four types of human airway cells are present, uh, including also the goblet cells and also the basal cells. Now, it's very important to understand that uh, ordinary cell culture only contains one cell type, whereas organisms contain all four cell types. And different viruses have different affinity or uh, tropism for different cell types in the uh, airway. So we need to have a very good organoid to have all the epithelial cell types present. So just to show you that this is uh, here, um, uh, uh, airway organoid with all the bidding cilia, which are moving the uh, central uh, amount of cell debris and also uh, mucin in a unidirectional manner. And that is at high power showing the amount of cilia that are beating. And recently, we make this uh, two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional nasal air, uh, airway organoid. You can see that the number of ciliated cells constitute around 60 to 70 percent of the cells which basically simulates the airway situation. And remember that it is easier to infect this uh, 2D airway organoid with viruses than uh, using the 3D organoid, which needs some degree of shearing. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, the virus can infect from the basolateral region instead of the apical region, which is the normal the, uh, the numinal the site from which uh, viruses enter the cell. Okay, so uh, this is the 12 well plate for baking the 3D airway organoid, and you can see that this is an organoid droplet uh, in the metric gel. And uh, what we did is we uh, dissociate this uh, organoid in a single cell and then seed it on this 24 trans well insert with what we call the air, li uh, air liquid interface. Now, so this single cell deposit here would draw, and then you can just see the video showing that uh, the cilia are beating, and then we can easily infect them by the putting viruses over them. So uh, in general, for infection experiment, this is much easier to do it with a 2D airway organoid than with the 3D organoid. Now remember that the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 are basically respiratory viruses. They infect our airways, not our gut. But in the case of the Chinese horse bats, uh, the virus, the SARS-related coronaviruses, are found in the feces, which means that the replication site is actually in the intestine, in the gut, not the airway. So we have to make a 3D, differenti 3D differentiated bed androids from the 
uh, adult tissue stem cells from the Chinese horse bat. And these are the uh, enteroids. And you can see that all four cell types are present from the enterocytes, the gold blood cells, the PNF cells, and also the, ent uh, the enteroendocrine cells are all present, which would allow the comprehensive uh, set of viruses to be able to infect uh, these uh, bad enteroids. And of course, we tried it with the SARS-CoV-2, and you can see that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can infect the enterocytes in these bad enteroids with the expression of nuclear proteins there. And these enterocytes are actually also uh, immunostain positive for the known entry receptors for SARS-CoV-2, including the ACE2 and also the TMPRSS2, which is an enzyme which activate the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And you can see that the viral load goes up to 10 to the power 9, and the virus titer goes to 10 to the power 6, showing that the bat enteroids is excellent for growing SARS-CoV-2. Now, it's not as easy as we think, of course, because viruses, once they enter the cell, they would induce the interferon response, which would reduce the amount of virus replication. Well, uh, even for SARS-CoV-2, they would activate the interferon response through the TPK1 and the IKK epsilon kinase, which then the cell would produce interferons. The interferons would activate uh, the interferon stimulated genes uh, through the JAKSTAT pathway. Now, and that is interesting. If that is the case, is there any way that would improve the performance of these enteroids for the culture of these bad viruses? Now, so we of course look at all the JAK inhibitors, but unfortunately, many of these JAK inhibitors, which can be used to suppress this kinase pathway, they also suppress the virus a bit, in, even in the case of SARS-CoV-2. Now, so that is very disappointing. But then we come across uh, this compound called CYT387, which is also called molilotinib, a very potent uh, kinase inhibitor against JAK12, TPK1, and also IKK epsilon. That is excellent because it would suppress all the uh, interferon pathway uh, through um, uh, this kinase inhibition. And then, of course, we tried it in our enteroids, in the bats, and also in human enteroids. And you can see that it actually markedly increased the amount of virus productions in both the bat and also the human enteroids. And not just for SARS-CoV-2, but even for uh, bat coronavirus HQU4, again, the quite a bit of increase in the amount of virus replication. Now, so what we want to do is we want to isolate bad viruses in bad androids and select those who are able to infect the human airway organoids. And that would select those or identify those viruses with potential of interspecies jumping. Now, of course, uh, that is one thing. Knowing which animal virus, which may jump species very, is one thing. We must have rapid detection system for the early diagnosis of the animal virus jumping into human. And also, we must have rapid detection system at the same time to exclude common human virus infection. And that we do it in collaboration with Terence Lau, uh, who make this machine, and we have to develop basically the amplification side, the biochemical side, and this machine is able to detect more than 30 known human uh, respiratory viruses or animal viruses with interspecies jumping potential. But even then, we would not be able to predict accurately which is the next pandemic virus. And we can't predict them, we would not know what is the antiviral susceptibility. And that's why we need to have broad spectrum antivirals available so that you can immediately reduce the morbidity and mortality of the, mix, of the next pandemic agent. So HIN uh, is able to find a compound here uh, which can inhibit the host Caspa6. Uh, which is part of the apoptosis pathway, which is an executor caspase. And this caspase 6 is being exploited by many viruses, coronaviruses, to degrade the nucleocapsid protein of the virus into fragments, which can bind to interferon regulatory free, so that it can no longer enter the nucleus 
and therefore cannot activate the interferon pathway. Now, fortunately, this CASP6 is being used by all coronaviruses, including some animal coronaviruses, uh, so that it would be a very ideal broad spectrum anti coronavirus agent. And then Shaofeng again identified another compound called ACA, which could block the pathogenic viruses from exploiting a host traffic protein called AP2M1, uh, so that it can no longer be used to traffic the virus to various organelles, say inside the nucleus for inference of virus, or to endoplasmic reticulum to transcribe its proteins. And all these pathogenic viruses has one characteristic. They all contain in the structural protein the Y-XX thiamine motif. And you can see that influenza virus have it, Bunya viruses have it, even HIV have it, Flavy viruses, the dengue viruses, all the coronaviruses, uh, the enteroviruses such as EV71 and even adenovirus have this uh, peculiar Y-XX thiamine motif in the structural protein which allow them to exploit the host traffic protein AP2M1 to complete the viral replication cycle. So finally, what we need is a universal vaccine platform which could be tailored to make vaccine readily uh, during the next pandemic. And Honglin used the reverse genetics technology, delete the virulent gene of influenza virus, the NS1, and then replace it with another protein fragment, the SARS-CoV-2 spike receptor binding domain, so that this vaccine can be used to protect influenza and also COVID-19 at the same time. So we immunized the hamsters with this dual mucosal vaccine and then challenged it with the wild type Omicron virus. And you can see that both in the lung and the nasal turbinate, there is no virus titer at all. So it actually achieved sterilizing immunity. More importantly, this mucosal vaccine grow much better at 33 degrees Celsius, which is our nasal pharyngeal temperature, and much worse, uh, fall log lower at high temperature, which means that it doesn't replicate in the lung very well. Now, so we now have this uh, intranasal spray mucosal vaccine ready, and uh, a company uh, is willing to take it to the market, and they make our first generation uh, COVID-19 vaccine on the influenza vector and then produce it and send it to Hong Kong and also test it in the mainland for phase one, two clinical trial. In Hong Kong here, we show that it is safe and then they do a phase three clinical trial. The data was just released and uh, they have over 3,000 volunteers taking this vaccine, uh, show reasonable protection in the unvaccinated and very good protection in the vaccinated or infected. Uh, vaccinated means intramuscular injection uh, with the uh, inactivated whole viral vaccine by Sinopharm or Sinovac. Uh, so at this stage in time, we are quite confident that this is likely to be a non-injection intranasal vaccine, which would uh, become what we call the next wave vaccine. So nobody wants to have injection every six months or one year, and people are much more willing to receive an intranasal mucosal vaccine. Uh, in summary, uh, tackling emerging infections would require animal surveillance for novel viruses so that we know what are the potential intruders. We need animal intestinal airway organoids and human airway organoids technology so that we can maximize the chance of isolating the novel animal coronaviruses and predict their potential for interspecies jumping. We need rapid multiplex nuclear exit amplification detection system using molecule fluidic technology for the early diagnosis of intrusion in our human population. And of course, we need broad spectrum antiviral agents so that early treatment can be used to reduce morbidity and mortality. And finally, we need mucosal vaccine platform to prevent the infection and the entry site, the airway, and to reduce virus shedding so as to reduce the risk of a pandemic. So uh, thanks to all my past and present collaborators and also the funding agencies. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Yun. Please be seated.
Friendly reminded, we have Q&A times after the panel discussions. For those Zoom participants, please raise your questions by using the Q&A function in Zoom. Now, I would like to pass the time to Professor Zhang in Shenzhen to welcome the next speaker, Professor Teng Chu. Professor Zhang, please. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, uh, Hello, Thank you very much, Professor Zhen, for the introduction. And thank you, Dennis, for the invitation. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so today, I would like to take this opportunity to talk to you about our efforts in building mirror image biology systems. Biology celebrates the seemingly limitless diversity of life. Yet at the fundamental level of biochemistry, all known forms of life are narrowly defined by a single version of molecular machinery based on L amino acids and D nucleosides that make up the proteins and DNAs and RNAs. And for some reason, life almost never uses the chiral twins, the D amino acids and L nucleosides, except in some very special cases for special functions. Such highly skewed choice of chirality has led to an interesting question as to whether mere image form of life, one that's made from D amino acids and L nucleosides, could also exist. Because if you flip everything in the mirror, the physics, the chemistry, the biology should also work. In fact, this idea was first proposed by Louis Pasteur in 1860, when he first discovered the molecular asymmetry of natural organic products. And there's a paragraph in his book. And there's a paragraph in his book that mentioned this idea of having a mirror image world of biology. However, more than 160 years have passed. Nobody has ever discovered this mirror image form of life in nature or succeeded in creating one in the lab. So we started thinking about this question. If you want to create this mirror image form of life, where would you start? We propose that we should start from the central dogma of molecular biology, because it's the fundamental operating system of life as we know it. And we want to realize the mirror image version of the central dogma, including mirror image genetic replication, transcription, and translation. For instance, if you want to realize the first step, mirror image DNA replication, essentially you need two things. First, you flip the DNA into mirror image DNA, then you flip the DNA polymerase into mirror image DNA polymerase. I use the mirror image DNA polymerase to copy the mirror image DNA. Very simple. And to obtain them, you can rely on these two synthesis technologies, the chemical synthesis of L nucleosides started in the 1960s, and the chemical synthesis of D proteins also started in the 1960s. However, there's a size limit of these chemically synthesized proteins, which is about 300 amino acids. But in comparison, the polymerases we're familiar with, such as the tag DNA polymerase, is over 800 amino acids, and even the clonal fragment, over 600, well beyond the capability of chemical protein synthesis at the time. So at this point, I thought I'd just figure out why people haven't done this experiment already, because it's such a simple idea. There must be a reason people didn't do it, and this is probably why, because they're too big. So this idea was put aside, and I didn't do anything about it for a long time. But the moment of realization came a few months later when I was working on a different project. So at the time, we were interested in this bizarre virus called the Flahouse virus. It's a eukaryotic virus, but only infects mitochondria and replicates the mitochondria. Why? My theory was that this could be an ancient bacteriophage that was brought into the eukaryotic system through the process of endosymbiosis. And to test my theory, I asked a student to do a sequence alignment of its polymerase with those from other bacteriophages to see if there's a match. Now, to cut a long story short, this project itself didn't work out so well. However, during the process of doing the sequence alignment, it reminded me of something. And that is some of these viral 
polymerase, these viral enzymes, they're quite different from those we're familiar with. Some of them lack in important domains, and maybe one of them can be small enough to be chemically synthesized. So after quick literature search, we found that African swan fever virus, ASFV pore X, is the smallest known DNA polymerase. It's very inefficient. It takes two minutes to copy one nucleotide, which probably also makes it the slowest polymerase in the world as well. It's highly error prone, but only has 174 amino acids, 20 kilodot. That's small enough to be chemically synthesized. So after I realized this, I quickly called up Professor Lei Liu in the chemistry department at Tsinghua, who is an expert in chemical protein synthesis. And the chemical synthesis of a natural carotid version and mirror energy version of ASFV pore X was carried out by a fantastic postdoc in Lei Liu's group, Wei Liang. And Zimo, a graduate student in my group, was able to use the mirror image polymerase for, to realize mirror image DNA polymerization for the first time. So on the left is the natural chirality system, on the right is the mirror image system, with a D polymerase working the L DNA template and supplied with L DNTPs. So everything is currently inverted, and we show that both systems were able to extend the primer to the full length in a few hours. We also demonstrated a proof of concept mirror image transcription because this polymerase also has RNA polymerase activity when it's supplied with the NTPs instead of DNTPs. Although the efficiency was even lower than that of DNA polymerization. So this may not seem like much because the efficiency is so low. However, conceptually, in the past, one can only chemically synthesize the LDNAs and RNAs. But since the first generation mirror image polymerase, Despite its low efficiency, you can start to copy, transcribe the mirror image DNAs and RNAs in a template directed fashion, and therefore allowing the genetic information to flow in a mirror image world of biology. So that's the proof of concept first generation mirror image polymerase. In the second generation, we wanted to make the system more efficient to realize the mirror image PCR, because we think PCR has just been such an important defining tool in modern molecular biology. If you can do mirror image PCR, you can do a lot of things. So we use the same strategy. We look for the smallest PCR enzyme, which is from the thermophilic archaea species. The enzyme is called DPO4, has 352 amino acids, 40 kilodalton. So this was actually pushing the limit of chemical protein synthesis. In fact, this was the largest chemically synthesized protein at the time. So the synthesis part was again carried out through collaboration with Lei Liu's group with three students from his lab and one student from my lab as well, because we wanted to learn how to do the chemical synthesis through the collaboration. Um, and then we chemically synthesized the mutant version of DPO4, we call it DPO4-5M. And using the mirror image DPO4, we were able to perform mirror image PCR, shown in the middle here. It looks like a regular PCR. But everything here, the template, the primer, the DNTPs, the polymers, everything's currently inverted. And also on the right, we show that the mirror image PCR products are indeed resistant to natural DNA swan digestion because the enzymes won't recognize it. Now, it's also worth mentioning that there's another group in Noxon Farmer who's interested in developing LDNA aptamers also independently designed a different version of DPO4, they call it DPO4-3C, which they chemically synthesize from mirror image PCR. And then we also found in the literature that there's a mutant version of DPO4 that can perform more efficient transcription. So here we also chemically synthesize the mutant version for a more efficient mirror image transcription of 120 nucleotide full length mirror image 5S ribosomal RNA. So to summarize a little bit here, we're able to synthesize a larger mirror image enzyme DPO4 at 352 amino acids and use it, use it to transcribe a longer LRNA at 120 nucleotides longer than we can chemically synthesize using oligosynthesizers. And we also realized a proof of concept mirror image reverse transcription using a mutant DPO4. Here we took the mirror image 5S ribosome RNA we transcribed, reverse transcribed, we mirror image PCR amplified it, therefore realizing a complete mirror image molecular toolbox. So at this point, we are pretty much done with the first two steps of the mirror image central dogma mirror image DNA replication, transcription, and reverse transcription. How about the last step, translation? We have to synthesize the entire mirror image ribosome, which is an enormous complex ribosomal RNAs and proteins, 
with a total molecular mass of over two megadalton. Let's break it down. Using the bacterial ribosome as a model system, you need three ribosomal RNAs, 21 tRNAs, 54 ribosomal proteins, and at least six essential translation factors. Now, if you remember, we have already taken the first step. The first mirror image RNA we transcribed was the 5S ribosomal RNA. So we can check the first box. Then we can also use the same method for transcribing all the tRNAs. However, charging the tRNA for the translation poses a challenge because you need this enzyme called AAIs, and these are big enzymes, and you need 21 of them. It's a lot of work to synthesize these AIs proteins. Fortunately, there's a ribozyme reported in the literature by others. It's called flexozyme. only has 46 nucleotides that can replace the function of AIs. So Ji and Meng Ying, my group, used the mirror image version of the flexozyme to charge the tRNAs. So we solved the tRNA charging problem using the mirror image flex design. And then we realized that the biggest challenge perhaps with synthesizing the mirror image ribosome is the 16S and 23S ribosome RNA, so 1.5 kb and 2.9 kb respectively. Um, earlier we mentioned that we can use mirror image transcription to transcribe long LRNA up to 120 nucleotides, but that's far from the kilobase long LRNA. More importantly, even if you can do the mirror image transcription, there's no mirror image gene available because they don't exist in nature. Where do you get the mirror image genes? So in real life, what we do is we can use gene assembly to assemble the genes. So in principle, we could use something like DPO4 from mirror image PCR. But the problem with DPO4 is that it's highly error prone polymerase. If you use DPO4 to assemble the genes, most of the sequences won't be correct. What we really need for mirror image gene assembly would be something like a high fidelity PFU DNA polymerase. But the problem is synthesizing the PFU DNA polymerase is that it's huge from a chemical synthesis point of view. At 775 amino acids, 90 kilodalton, it's more than twice the size of DPO4, which, by the way, was the largest chemically synthesized protein at the time. So at this point, we just couldn't find any chemistry student to help us synthesize it because it's too big. Fortunately, most of the students in our group come from biology background, so they haven't learned chemistry before. They don't even know where the box is, so they wanted to give it a try. So together, we demolished half our, of our biology lab, and we built a chemistry lab from scratch, tried to do the chemical synthesis. So long story short, we developed new methodology including using split protein design that simplifies the problem into the synthesis of two smaller protein fragments, which can co-fold in vitro into a functionally intact enzyme. We also use new isolution substitution to solve the synthesis of uh, the problem with synthesizing the hydrophobic peptides, as well as to reduce the d amino acid costs. And the synthesis of the PFU DNA polymerase was carried out by a fantastic graduate student in my group, Chu Yao. This is the M fragment, and this is the C fragment, all at milligram scales. And Qiang was able to perform mirror image gene assembly to assemble a full length 16S ribosome RNA, RNA, uh, ribosome RNA gene at 1.5 kb. So to summarize a little bit, we were able to synthesize an even larger mirror image enzyme at 90 kilodalton, and with it, we were able to assemble the longest LRNA at 1.5 kb. Then, how do you transcribe them into long LRNAs? And there, I need to, here I need to talk about some of, of our most recent unpublished work. We synthesized the T7 RNA polymerase. The T7 RNA polymerase is, is even larger. At 883 amino acids, 100 kilodalton. Uh, so this work was carried out by another fantastic graduate student, Yuan. So she was able to design a double split version of the T7 RNA polymerase, which simplifies the problem into the synthesis of three smaller fragments. This is the N fragment, this is the M fragment, and this is the C fragment, all at milligram scales. And using the in vitro folded T7 RNA polymerase, she was able to perform mirror image T7 transcription to obtain all the full length 5S, 16S, and 23S ribosomal RNAs up to 2.9 kb. So together, these mirror image ribosomal RNAs, they will constitute the structural and catalytic core of the mirror image ribosome at approximately two-thirds of its molecular mass. 
So to summarize a little bit here, we're able to synthesize an even larger mirror image enzyme at 100 kilodalton, which in turn helped us transcribe the longest lRNA at 2.9 kb. And the reason I think we we're able to achieve this is that we brought together these two parallel fields, the chemical synthesis of l nucleic acids and the chemical synthesis of D proteins, and make them cross to form a mirror image biology system. I use the system to overcome the limitations of pure chemical synthesis so that we can keep pushing the limit so that these LDNAs and RNAs and mirror image proteins can go beyond chemistry, beyond monomers and polymers to become true biology. So with the new methodology and third generation polymerases, we were able to transcribe all the 16S and 23S ribosome RNAs. So that's the RNA part. Now, how about the ribosomal proteins? We have 54 ribosomal proteins, but most of them are quite small, less than 300 amino acids. So they're much smaller than the enzymes we have, we have just synthesized, except the S1 protein is slightly larger. So we started this effort a few years ago by synthesizing the three L5, L18, and L25 done by Chu Yao and Junjie. And after that, we accelerated the, the process and carried out by three students, Han and Ming and Junwei, and we currently have already chemically synthesized 53 out of the 54 ribosomal proteins, although we are synthesizing the natural chirality version first without PTMs. So the idea is we assemble them using these in vitro ribosome assembly methods that we reported in the past in the natural chirality fir version first. And if it works, then we do again, do everything again in the mirror image version. So the hope is that eventually you can put everything together to form a mirror image ribosome, which can perform mirror image translation of deep proteins. And that will complete the mirror image central dogma. And this is what we call the system. Once you have the system, you have new applications. For instance, you can use the mirror image ribosome to translate the enzymes, the antibodies. You can also use the system to select for LDNA RNA aptamers. These mirror image aptamers, they're nucleus resistant, they have long half-life in vivo, and they have low immunogenicity. In the past, people used the indirect method called selection reflection, but it's very difficult to code to carry out. Now that we have LDNA library, we have mirror image PCR, we can do the selection directly. However, there's another technical issue here. After the selection of the LDNA aptamer, you still have to sequence it. But none of the DNA sequences we have today can sequence the LDNA. So we have to develop our own sequencing technique as well. So we developed two versions. One is based on chemical sequencing using the Otis, Max, and Gilbert DNA sequencing method with eight chiral chemicals. And the other is mirror image DNA sequencing by synthesis using the mirror image polymerases we have developed. And using these techniques, Ji was able to perform mirror image selection targeting native human thrombin, he was able to select for LDNA aptamer with a KD at 29 nanomolar. We also perform a proof of concept LDNA aptamer Western blot. So for certain applications, we think that LDNA aptamers may replace the expensive antibodies. So that's one of the applications of mirror image DNA sequencing. Another potential application is in information storage. Here, we took this paragraph from Louis Pasteur's book that first mentioned this idea of having a mirror image world of biology. We encoded and wrote it in LDNA and store it in there, and we were able to PCR amplify it back and use the LDNA sequencing to read back the information, therefore realizing mirror image DNA information storage. We also tried the long-term LDNA information storage in the environment. We took water samples from this famous site, Lotus Pond in, in Beijing at Tsinghua University, uh, we put LDNA in there for a year. And after a year, we come back to PCR Amplify back. We're able to read back the information. By contrast, the natural chirality DDNA got degraded within a day. Another potential application is used to use the LRNA system to study RNA RMP structure and function. This is something we realized when we were designing a mirror image rival switch based on the natural chirality design that was reported before. It's not surprising that both systems worked, but what's surprising is that when we store them under so-called RNA-free conditions and measure the half-life, the dRNA measure 15 days, lRNA 43 days, more than twice as long. Why? We think that it's because these real experiments are never as clean 
as we hope. Because for DNA, there's always a little bit of RNA contamination because it's everywhere. It's virtually impossible to get rid of. But for lRNA, the system is completely decoupled from RNA degradation. So this is perhaps the true hydrolysis kinetics that we measured for the first time. We went further to test the stability of kilobase long lRNA. Here we took the 6 dx ribosomal RNA. The dRNA got degraded within hours, even in the presence of RNA inhibitor. The mirror image RNA lasted for hundreds of hours, more than two orders of magnitude difference in estimated half-lives. We even tested them in the lotus pond water. The, LR, the dRNA got degraded within an hour. The lRNA lasted for days. Again, it's very different hydrolysis kinetics. So we think this may open another dimension, discovery. We can use the system to study RNA biology to discover new RNA hydrolysis kinetics, which is perhaps the true hydrolysis kinetics, because the system is free from the interference of RNA's contamination. We can also use the system to study ribozymes. Here we developed the L-ribozyme catalyzed L-RNA polymerization system as a model for studying the origin of life. Another potential discovery that could be made is to search for new life forms. This goes back to my interest as a postdoc in the Zuba lab and the Rafkin lab. Uh, when we were designing a DNA sequencer that we would like to send to Mars to sequence Martian life. However, now think about it. If you send a DNA sequencer to Mars, you have about 50% chance of getting the chirality right. So maybe in the future, we should send a mirror image DNA sequencer to Mars as well to sequence to sequence alien mirror image life on other planets. Or maybe, perhaps, mirror image life has always been here on our planet, hidden in the depths of lakes and oceans or frozen in time, waiting to be discovered, simply because we didn't have the right tools, such as mirror image PCR and LDNA sequencing to look for them. And now that we have these tools, maybe it's time to start searching. So in the end, I just want to echo what Dennis mentioned at the beginning, that the new system has, will almost inevitably lead to new applications and new discoveries. And they're all interlinked in that the further you go in one direction, the more you achieve in the others. And every step you take makes your next step easier. And that's exactly why realizing the mirror image central dogma is central, because in the past, one can only chemically synthesize the D-proteins, the LDNAs, RNAs. But since the first, second, and third generation mirror image polymerases, you can start to copy, transcribe, and reverse transcribe them. However, the D-proteins still have to be chemically synthesized. But once they have the mirror image, centri mirror image ribosome, therefore complete mirror image central dogma, then you don't need the chemical synthesis anymore. The mirror image ribosome will translate them directly. More importantly, the first mirror image ribosome will make more mirror image ribosomes. And this system become a self-sustained system and eventually lead to the creation of a mirror image world of biology. Hopefully, it will be a better world than ours. So with that, I'd like to close by acknowledging the fantastic students and collaborators, especially Professor Lei Liu, for helping us with the chemical protein synthesis at the beginning of this project and funding from Westlake University, Tsinghua University, Center for Life Sciences, and the National Science Foundation of China. Thank you very much. Vivian. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. We are now start the panel discussion. May I start by inviting the moderator, Professor Lo, and panelists, Professor Yip and Professor Yun, go on the stage here at the Hong Kong Valley. And also Professor Chu to go on stage at the Shenzhen Valley. For the audience, you may prepare your questions in English or Putonghua and ask in Q&A time after the, the panel discussions. Because of the time limit, we can only have one question for Hong Kong venue and one question for Shenzhen. Now, may I pass the time to Professor Lo to start the discussion? Professor Lo, please. Uh, so thank you very much. I think it's um, 
really a fascinating session and really opened up our mind. Uh, so, Professor Zhu, can you hear me at all? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since um, our memory is uh, fresh in our mind, so maybe I'll just start by asking your good self. Uh, I find your talk really very thought-provoking, but one question which I have in my mind, which I can't get quite clear, is that on the one side, you are saying that those uh, mirror image uh, molecules are sort of resistant to our sort of um, biology, okay? But, but if that's mm -hmm. the case, that means that they are not really completely functional uh, in our system. Now, if, if that's the case, then I don't know how one can make the case that they are applicable uh, pharma, as a pharma, uh, as a drugs or other thing. So, mm -hmm. so how do you address that? Yeah, so I, I think it's because the natural sequences of the proteins and DNAs and RNAs are quite limited. Um, so if you use that sequence space and you reverse the chirality, and most of the cases, they won't interact. However, if you expanded that sequence space to much larger unexplored sequence by nature, for instance, the selection scheme we develop uh, to select artificial sequences, then there's a chance to make have a hit of artificial sequence that can interact with the natural sequence. Thank you. But of course, uh, we, we are talking about the still probability that it may not work, right? It, it's it's right, possible right. that we could, but it's also possible we may not, right? Right, yeah. right. Thank you. And then, of course, another question is that uh, if those molecules are so stable, say, in, your, in the pond in your university, then would that be environmental concern? That somehow they're not degraded and they're toxic somehow? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think these mirror image molecules, they're made from the same elements and same composition as natural molecules, that, such as DNAs and proteins, uh, except for different handedness. Uh, so they're not that different. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also potential, there's certainly a potential risk for uh, toxicity and even uh, misuse. So I, I think people fear what they don't understand. And that's okay. That's the nature of being you. And that's exactly why we need to try to study and understand them using scientific ways, uh, the knowledge of which can help us mitigate the potential risk of misuse. Thank you. Because I can, uh, this final comment from me at least, is I find it's amazing. Of course, if, uh, if you continue this way, m maybe eventually you create some animals, right? Some mice, which are mirror image mice. And that would be interesting that those mice will see the normal mice and maybe they cannot eat you know, the same sort of food. They're, they seem to have two parallel ecosystem, right? They're present and yet cannot completely interact. Is that yeah, yeah. image, uh, you know, uh, your view as well? Yeah. I, I think we are still very far from being able to create a real living organism, because even with a natural chirality system, nobody has ever, I think we are still, we're not even close to being able to do that. So what we are trying, what we are trying to create, perhaps in our lifetime, is to create an in vitro biology system with these mirror image molecules that we think can already have a lot of potential applications and lead to new, potentially lead to new discoveries in biology. To help, as I, as I sh I've shown in our work, as a model for studying real, real life. Uh, Nancy and KY, um, might you have any questions for uh, Professor Zhu at all? No, I, I, I find your work to be extremely fascinating. I totally agree with you that when you okay. create new knowledge, when there's not much that's known, there's obviously, you know, this uh, uncertainty involved. But I think this is precisely why we are uh, doing this kind of work, is to create new knowledge. And I, I really applaud you for taking on this uh, type of project. I think it's extremely fascinating and very useful. Thank, Thank you. you. KY? Really marvelous work. My uh, intuitive response as a virologist is that, uh, well, it's horrible if we create a, a virus with these uh, chiral, chiral molecules that cannot be degraded. That is horrible. 
But uh, then I am uh, very reassured because it should not be able to infect ourselves with a completely different chirality. But at the same time, it's perhaps important for you to consider making RNAs and DNAs with your chiral molecules as a safeguard so that just in case something happens, you can degrade all of them. Thank you. Over. <laughs> Thank you. KY. Thank you for the, for the suggestion. Thank you. So maybe we move back, um, for example, to Nancy. So your work is um, amazing because Alzheimer's is really a big scourge in the public health. Um, just now you show a slide. Of course, um, a known genetic marker for Alzheimer's is APOE. Mm -hmm. So how, what is the strength of your marker compared with APOE? Right, so APOE4, I think, is the, the most well-known uh, risk genes for Alzheimer's disease. So what I have presented is development of a blood-based uh, biomarker panel. So this is looking at the uh, protein level of, uh, you know, at, it, it serves as a snapshot at that time when we uh, identify these biomarkers and these biomarkers can distinguish um, the, uh, the individuals that have AD versus the healthy control, it can also stage, you know, uh, the disease. So, interestingly, our, our other work that I show on SolarVest T2, it seems to have an impact uh, that is most significant in, the, in individuals that carry APOE4. So, we believe that, uh, you know, studying the, the the ST2 signaling pathway will actually somehow converge with the APOE4 pathway to give us a much better understanding of the under, underlying biology of the disease. So in short, APOE4 is a risk gene. But APOE4 itself, if you look at the uh, genetic profiling, at best it can only allow you to identify individuals that carry that particular risk allele but it doesn't really give you the, the score on the, um, on the uh, you know, status of the diagnosis. So APOE4 itself is not a diagnostic tool. Mm. But what we have developed is a blood-based biomarker diagnostic tool that is uh, you know, extremely different and is on, in a different uh, you know, uh, area compared to APOE4. So we, we cannot do simply APOE4 testing and say that individual really has AD. It cannot. It's just a risk gene. But using the 19-protein biomarker panel, I can tell you with over 96% accuracy that you are at risk to get the disease. Mm -hmm. And also, just now you alluded to that the pathogenesis mm -hmm could already happen, let's say, 20 years before the actual symptoms is uh, noticeable. So your um, protein marker panel, how early in that 20-year process can you detect? Very good question. We, we believe that um, it can detect five to 10 years before the onset of the clinical symptoms. Mm -hmm. And we are still doing a lot of analysis, uh, especially based on mild cognitive impair individuals mm -hmm. in order to uh, really define the time period uh, before the onset of the clinical symptoms. So we believe that we, with further refinement of the, uh, of the tools and also with a much larger sample database, we'll be able to get a more accurate uh, time window uh, you know, with which our diagnostic tool will be able to, to do the prediction. So if you were to guess, how quickly do you think your panel might be launched? Because I think that's a big public health implication. Uh, we are hoping maybe next year, uh, oh. because what, what we have done is to set up this uh, blood-based test in the lab, mm -hmm. and it's for research. In order for us to take it uh, you know, to the market, I believe uh, there are a number of uh, uh, steps we, we have to accomplish. One is to make it cost effective, because right now it's expensive because of the, uh, of the technology platform that we use. So we have to 
simplify it and make it more cost effective. The other one is to reduce the number of proteins. We believe that 19 protein is still a bit on the high side. So we are trying to reduce the number of proteins, so let's say seven or, or eight, and that would lower the cost. So, so you know, in the next few months, uh, we have to make sure that the panel that we uh, will use to do um, large-scale screening will be cost-effective, will be affordable, and but of course with the same uh, degree of accuracy, and also simpler to manipulate. Because right now, you know, uh, the technical staff has to go through a lot of training in order to use the technology platform. So we are optimistic that sometime next year we'll be able to uh, make it available to the general publications uh, population so we can do large-scale screening. Thank you. Yeah. KY, might you have, have any questions for Nancy? Oh, no. really fantastic work. And uh, I just want to declare that I'm almost 66 years of age. <laughs> And uh, my memory is definitely worse than 10 years ago, and I hope that your work would go faster <laughs> so that I can one day use... I, I just wonder whether it is you are able to manipulate the interferon 33 or the ST uh, protein so as to improve the mice amount of uh, deposition of plug amyloids. Is yeah. that possible already? Yeah, we have done uh, that work. So if we inject IL-33, into the mice, the mice actually have improved uh, memory performance. And if we uh, lower the level of solo st 2 it also improves the cognitive performance. So we can do all that in a mouse model. And so now what we're doing is to find modulators of solo st 2 that can suppress the expression because suppression of solo st 2 is good. So we're trying to um, actually test it in the mice, and, and we are doing all these studies in the non-human primate as well, so that it would be beyond the, uh, the mouse model. So uh, once we can achieve that, then I think we'll be ready for doing a lot of the uh, preclinical studies. Yeah. Uh, so Ting, I wonder, might you have any question for Professor Nancy Yip? Oh, I actually have a question for you, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so so you have you have been using the latest technologies, applying them to your original idea of uh, having cell-free DNA in the blood. Uh, but conversely, if you get to choose, um, what kind of technology do you hope that be, will be available that to help accelerate and to advance your your platform? Okay, so thank you. Now, so uh, just now I present about this discovery of those super long molecules. Uh, but currently, in the, on the market, there are only two of those platforms, which is the Pacific Bioscience, and one is the Oxford Nanopore. Now, but with Pacific Bioscience, the problem is that you only have 8 million wells, so you can analyze at most 8 million molecules in one go. But for Illumina sequencer, you're talking about 3 billion molecules. So basically, molecule by molecule, uh, the current system is too expensive. And similarly, for Oxford Nanopore, you're talking about 500 to 3,000 holes. So, so what I want is basically something, uh, a single molecule sequencer with a throughput of an Illumina sequencer. So I don't know when that might be uh, available. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I also have a question for you, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the uh, cell-free uh, DNA and uh, cell-free RNA, I mean, obviously, it has tremendous diagnostic value. What do you think about the potential uh, of them in terms of uh, revealing, you know, the, the underbiology of the diseases or even for treatment? Do you think they have values for doing that? Okay, now for treatment, uh, we have actually some model system. Now, because a lot of prenatal disease uh, at the moment, of course, there are no treatment. But one of the conditions we've been working on is called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH. It's a genetic disorder of the endocrine system in which the baby will have too much male sex hormones. So you can imagine if a baby is a girl, then when she was born, her external genitalia could look very much like a male. And then subsequently, she will need a lot of surgery to be corrected. But what happens is that if you know that the baby girl has this condition, 
you can actually treat the mother with some steroid hormones before eight weeks. So this is a work that we've been working in collaboration with Maria New, who is a world authority on this condition. So hopefully that will herald the beginning of something which we can treat, combined detection and treatment. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so maybe we'll come to KY. So now, I find that you mentioned the, the bats, having 39% of them, having some sort of coronavirus, very interesting. Does that mean that when the bats have coronavirus infection, it's a chronic infection? Uh, no, uh, actually the amount of virus, uh, when we see really monitor some of them, actually goes down with time. And they do amount of neutralizing antibody response. But the duration of shedding can be quite long. And for those uh, which are really carrying it, they do have a lower body weight, but they have no symptoms. Uh, which means that uh, some of them may shed for a long time, while others can have self-limiting and uh, infection with mount uh, neutralizing antibody response very rapidly. And genomics uh, show that uh, the bat's immune system can be quite different. They tend to have an expanded uh, energy-producing part of the genome because they fly, they need a lot of energy. And at the same time, because uh, you know that when the temperature is high, the temperature is talking about 40 to 42 degrees Celsius all the mm. time because especially when they fly, the temperature goes very high. Mm. So the DNA damage could be quite severe. So they have a, a system in the genome that tend to repair the DNA. And then the immune part is actually shrunk. So they tend to tolerate the virus, share the virus for a longer time. And uh, maybe that's the reason why the bats are the favored animals, uh, which lead to emerging infection and of course, uh, they fly all over the place and then they spread the virus uh, all over the place, all over the place at the same time. Thank you. So is your uh, data on 55% on the unvaccinated people for the Omicron variant? Yes. So that is, uh, to me, I'm not expert. So 55% of Omicron is quite good already, right? Well, we think that it's quite good already. First, <laughs> Is the WHO say that anything more than 50% is acceptable? Okay. The second, when we are using the first generation vaccine, the spike receptor binding domain is actually from the Wuhan prototype, mm -hmm. not the Omicron. And with this, we think that this is, to me, surprisingly good already. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy about it. Thank you. Now, since we have only three minutes left, so we can actually take one question from here. Yes, please, uh, Genius. Uh, could we pass a mic to um, um, the Honourable Mr. Janice Hall? I'm fascinated um, uh, by the talk introduced by Nancy. Um, now, in terms of the um, practicality and also the economic uh, implication, um, you, you, you did say that uh, your new method will be cost-effective in future, hopefully, as compared to the current uh, clinical diagnosis uh, by way of such as uh, the imaging, uh, taking uh, the, the brain uh, uh, imaging. Now, uh, how do you forecast uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, cost uh, implication in future? How much would it be safer? First of all, I do not know how much it would incur uh, by uh, uh, diagnosis uh, through the current uh, um, regime. And how, how, how should we gauge and compare these two, now and future? through your new technology. Thank you. Right, so currently um, the clinical diagnosis is uh, performed by the medical doctors, right? But, but that kind of approach is not very uh, objective. And the other way is to do brain imaging, so such as amyloid PET imaging, and I, my understanding is it's about 20,000 Hong Kong dollars, roughly. And then there's also the uh, you know, biomarkers using CSF, but that one I don't think is uh, is available in Hong Kong yet, um, and that one is considered rather uh, in invasive. So uh, the uh, the the blood test that we have developed uh, in the lab uh, at cost is is about twelve thousand Hong Kong dollars, uh, but we're trying to make it more cost effective, that means it will be lower than that. And so I think it, the ultimate uh, cost, I think, will depend on the optimization that we'll do in the next uh, few months. Uh, because the, the goal is really to make it more 
available to the general population for those who are interested uh, to, to find out. So uh, I think, again, the optimization of, of the diagnostic test is ongoing, and hopefully there will be more information sometime next year. Okay, so the last question we'll pass to the participants at the Sunjian venue, please. Oh, thank you. Shenzhen现场的老师和同学,有没有问题?我们现在可以发问. Uh, I have a question for Professor Zhu. Question is, what's the meaning of neural image, image biology and what kinds of biological problems we can use to research? Thank you. Um, so your first question, what is mirror image biology? Uh, what, we, what we mean by mirror image biology is biology systems with a currently inverted uh, version of basic building blocks, such as D amino acids and L nuclear acids. And your second question, what can we do? What can we study using these um, mirror image biology system? I think it's because these mirror image molecules, such as mirror image DNAs, RNAs, and proteins, they are the chiral twin of the natural DNAs, RNAs, and proteins. So they behave in a very similar way. So they, be, they become a very unique model system, as we have shown in some of our work using lRNA as a model system to study RNA biology. For instance, discovering new RNA hydrolysis kinetics. We, we also use them for as potential drugs and for information storage medium. Um, but that's just some of the possibilities we can think of right now, and there are so many more, uh, because essentially can do everything again in a mirror image version. And so I think you asked that excellent question here, because it's a question I cannot answer by myself at the moment. And it's a question I would like to share with the students and postdocs and young scientists in the audience. A question that I hope the future version of you working on these topics can help me answer. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. I know there are many students and teachers have questions, but because we have to program in the morning, so we can cut the time short. Uh, uh, my apology. Uh, back to you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful sharing. And thank you, professors. Please be seated. Thank you. After an enriching morning, it's now time to take a lunch break. The lunch room will be held at Cup 1 on the park. It takes three minutes to walk here. Our helpers will show the way. Please follow the signs and their direction. The lunch room will have free seating. You may select the seats you like except those in the reserved tables. Please come back before 13.15. The next section will start at 13.20. Enjoy the lunch and see you later.